You know, guys, I'm as big a fan of Chinese surplus as anyone else out there. I love the SKS or Togriff pistol or even the Mosin Nagats they made, the little shorty boys. But, you know, some people are just stuck. They think that this is still the current state of Chinese firearms. And that's just not true. They've developed bullpup rifles, they've modern rifles, and they even have something that challenges the Sig Spear LT. Let's talk about the history of Chinese firearm development. everybody, welcome to Classic Firearms. I'm Matt, and we're gonna examine something I feel is a kind of underappreciated segment of firearms, which are Chinese firearms and Chinese military arms, uh, because they've been banned for a while from being imported in the US, uh, with very few exceptions. It's really hard to get Chinese uh, rifles or handguns into the country. So, you know, I don't think that they are as appreciated as much as other countries' firearms. Now, when most of us think about Chinese firearms, I think they, we primarily focus on the two guns that are on the table here. So both of these, uh, kind of confusingly enough, are Type 56 rifles. There's the Type 56 AK, the Type 56 SKS. And uh, both of these were of course introduced to China through the relationship between Communist China and Communist Russia. Uh, so they are originally Russian designed firearms that they sent, you know, technical information and things for the Chinese to be able to produce them domestically. Uh, and in this case, this is actually a James River Armory manufactured off of a Chinese parts kit on a US made receiver and barrel. However, this is original Chinese production as far as this SKS goes, uh, made by Norinco in China. Now, you know, again, I think most of us, these are probably the rifles that we think of when we think of Chinese military arms. But like any other country, China's gone through a lot of small arms development. And so it's not accurate to expect, you know, that these are things that are still in use, at least in a non kind of ceremonial uh, situation, because the military invests quite a lot of money in developing new small arms technology in China, just like they do in most other countries in the world. So we want to fill the gap between the Type 56 rifles and the current QBZ-191. So after the Type 56, the next rifle that the Chinese developed was the Type 63. Now I have this SKS still here with me because the Type 63 looks a lot like an SKS. Uh, and indeed, there are a lot of similarities in function, at least in part. So they kept the short stroke gas piston, um, but rather than the tilting bolt of an SKS, they went to a rotating bolt. So the, the way the lockups work in a normal SKS is that the bolt actually tips down, so the rear of the bolt is supported against a shoulder in the receiver. That's what keeps the action from opening. Uh, however, they went to a rotating bolt, similar to an AK or an AR-15 even, where it locked into lugs. Now, the chambering was still in 760 by 39, and it had a detachable magazine, so it could accept either its proprietary 20-round magazine or a modif modified 30-round uh, AK-47 mag. Um, so, it was mostly shot in, in single fire. However, they did have the capability of making them in uh, select fire as well. And this was kind of a short lived rifle in service and kind of relegated to secondary lines uh, within the military uh, because they were not satisfied with you know the performance of this rifle, even though it did show increased accuracy over the Type 56 AK-47. So that brings us to the next one in line. So we brought back our friend the Type 56 AK to talk about the next rifle in development, which was the Type 81. So the Type 81 uh, looks overall like an AK-47, or at least as much like an AK-47 as something similar like, say, a VZ-58, uh, which is to say the lines are kind of the same. But uh, there were a number of differences. First, the front sight was kind of further back on the barrel because they wanted to be able to shoot rifle grenades. So if you've ever seen rifle grenade attachments for say a Yugo AK, where they can thread on an extension that gives something for the rifle grenade to slide over and then be fired with a blank round. Well, they just had that as a standard feature on all the Type 81s. So that required that the front sight not be all the way to the end of the barrel. Also, you would see space in here. You can see how close the magazine is to the front of the trigger guard. There would actually be some space in here because they actually lengthened the action somewhat uh, in order to help uh, you know, mitigate recoil, they could put a longer, stiffer spring inside of it. Um, also, it was still short stroke gas operated. So the Chinese 
pretty early there in their development have finalized on something that's going to carry through the rest of the rifles which is a short strip gas operation with a rotating bolt they seem to like those two features in combination and it's no wonder why there's tons of popular rifles out there on the market today that utilize both of those features things like the ar-180 the scar 16s or 17 uh, CZ Bren, many, many rifles out there combined sh short shirt gas operation and a rotating bolt. So the Chinese definitely had a very, very practical combination of those features there. Uh, this was available in a wood stock fixed stock model as well as a folding stock model. So the Type 81 was that next step. But again, they weren't satisfied with the, the performance of the Type 81. Uh, they wanted to look at something that uh, they felt could really become a more modern firearm uh, as opposed to, you know, wood furniture firearms. So that'll bring us all the way up to the next model, which is the QBZ-95. So the QBZ-95 was a radical departure from the Chinese because first off, it was a bullpup. We have a Springfield Hellion here as kind of a visual aid. Uh, the overall lines of this rifle and the QBZ-95 are pretty similar, including the fact that it had a charging handle at the top underneath the carry handle. So, uh, you know, this was also where we changed caliber. So previous rifles had all been in 7.62 by 39. The Chinese never really adopted 545, even though the Russians had developed that round. Uh, but they decided that they were going to follow the trend followed internationally by most militaries of going to a smaller, lighter weight round that had higher velocity and you could carry more of. So, you know, in the US, we adopted 556, Russia adopted 545 by 39. And China developed their own round, which is the 5.8 by 42. And in fact, some of the very later produced models of the type of the Type 81 rifle were chambered in that round uh, during that kind of transition to the QBZ 95. Now, QBZ sort of just a model designation, like how we say M16. Uh, it specifically means light automatic rifle, or you know, so kind of think of it as small arms. Uh, but yeah, so that's the, the meaning behind the QBZ designation. Uh, you know, there were a lot of interesting mechanical things about the QBZ 95, such as internally, it was not a hammer fired gun. It was actually striker fired and used one spring, uh, sorry, two springs on one guide rod for both the main recoil spring and the striker. So they were kind of inline springs on one guide rod. Uh, internally, it functioned very much like the VZ-58, which is another striker-fired gun that looks kind of like an AK, uh, but it's it's not internally very, very different. You know what, guys? I'm actually, uh, I got a VZ-58 down here. I had, a, I had to go grab real quick. Uh, so the VZ-58, as you can see, again, lines are similar to an AK-47. However, internally, super different. Uh, overall, very different, but uh, again, you know, that cosmetic appearance kind of uh, tricks people sometimes. But like the QBZ-95, the VZ-58 is a striker-fired firearm. However, this uses two different springs uh, versus the QBZ-95 QBZ uh, using a single guide rod with the two different springs. Um, we're going to go ahead and put this down. Uh, but, you know, the QBZ-95 had three different barrel lengths. So they had kind of their standard issue barrel. They had a CQB barrel. And then they actually had a DMR kind of model. Uh, it's funny to think of a designated marksmanship rifle in a bullpup configuration. Uh, at least it is to me. So the standard issue barrel was actually 18.2 inches. Uh, the CQB model had like a 14 and a half inch barrel, which is an interesting number. And I'll get to that a little bit later why it's interesting that that's the, the CQB model. And then they had a DMR barrel that was 23 inches long. Uh, again, it was in the 5.8 by 42 caliber. And the Chinese claim that that has better ballistics than either 5.56 or 5.45. However, since they don't really share testing data, it's awfully hard to determine whether that to be the case. Um, the cartridge shot uh, from a barrel that was between one in seven and one in nine and a half, basically twists, depending on barrel length. Also that would change depending on the weight of the bullet. So over time, uh, you know, the 5.8 is a pretty similar round to 5.56 when you look at uh, some of the information. Uh, weights for the, the for the projectiles varied from 64 grain up to about 77 grain. So, you know, very common with the 5.56, uh, as well as those twist rates between one and seven, one and nine, or nine and a half in this case. Uh, so you have to imagine that you're gonna have a, a pretty similar performance to a 5.56 uh, firearm. But, uh, but yeah, you know, similar, uh, you know, it had a hook 
for the charging handle, kind of like early AR-10s. And in fact, this was used a lot for a very long time. Uh, it was adopted in 1997 and it's served all the way up until the adoption of the replacement rifle, spoilers, uh, that got adopted in 2019. So, you know, a decently long service life for a military rifle. It was not going to serve by itself, however, as in 2003, the Chinese military did adopt kind of a supplementary rifle, which is the QBZ-03. Uh, the QBZ-03 was a much more traditional styled firearm. It had a more conventional layout uh, and it shared several features with this firearm as well as the next firearm coming out. Uh, which will be the QBZ-191. So one interesting thing I kind of forgot to mention was that the QBZ-95 is actually offered internationally, uh, military and civilian markets. So they had a select fire and a semi-auto only version, uh, but it was in 5.56. So for a while, you could actually pick these things up in Canada, but uh, the Canadian government shortly decided to change it and make them a prohibited firearm. But you know, other militaries around the world were also offered sales of select fire uh, QBZ-95s in 5.56 rather than the proprietary 5.8 by 42. Uh, that kind of brings us to the current armament of the Chinese military, which is the QBZ-191. That's wrong, Matt. That's wrong. What, what That's do you mean? still the old news. That's old news. Yeah. Yeah. This is the new <laughs> of China. I mean, right armament maybe, but rifle, no, not really. Uh, yeah, that's what um, we should have done. I'm very surprised. Hey, you did that right as, away. As soon as we saw it, yeah. Yeah, whatever this is, this is all just like the distraction. Uh, okay, there we go. What? So the QBZ-191 so is the current service rifle of the uh, Chinese military. And uh, to kind of give you a visual representation of that, we have two of what I felt were the closest options that I have available to me. Uh, the M&M M10X Plus, and this, this is the CZ Bren 2. Now, uh, again, going with the idea that 5.8 is a fairly similar cartridge to 5.56, uh, the CZ Brand 2 is a split receiver model. It is short stroke operated with a rotating bolt. Options are 5.56. You can also get it in 7.62 by 39. Uh, this obviously is a pistol version of the firearm, uh, but so it has overall very similar characteristics to the QBZ-191. Uh, now, I really think that this kind of captures the look of the 191. Uh, so again, the M10X uh, has upper and lower receiver. now. The QBZ-191 has machined aluminum upper and lower receivers, uh, short, short gas operation, rotating bolt. It has polymer furniture, including the, the handguard, a extending buttstock and pistol grip, adjustable gas system. Uh, I'm not sure if it's M-Lock specifically, but the handguards are now able to accept some kind of uh, detachable accessories where they were able to use some kind of uh, attachment method to add extra things like vertical hand grips. Uh, now, they do use Rock and Lock magazine still. It's just in their proprietary 5.8 by 42. Uh, so overall, I think that other than being in 7.62 by 39 and long stroke, this very much captures the appearance of the 191. Uh, now, the 191 does have a reciprocating charging handle, kind of like an older model SCAR. Uh, it has a bolt release on the left side, very much kind of like an AR. and. Uh, yeah, you know, it, it's very interesting how, you know, it, it it develops and it seems to carry over a lot of the most common features that you find on a lot of guns just into China's own unique gun. Uh, they do usually come flat top and come standard issue with a three times uh, prism scope, prism sc sight. Uh, however, there are other options out there available. Uh, again, there are standard length kind of carbine models, a CQB model and a DMR model. Uh, much like the previous QBZ-95. So in this case, remember I told you 14.5 was an interesting number for uh, for the, the last one? Well, 14.5 inch barrel is the standard issue carbine model uh, barrel for the QBZ-191. The CQB rifle is a 10.5 inch barrel and the DMR model is a 21 inch barrel. Uh, again, typically you'd expect the DMR models uh, to use a different sight. They had a Kind of an LVPO 3 to 8.4 power and they have you know Chinese developed thermal and night vision optics as well that would be usable with those things. The DMR model is specifically definitely I would classify more of a DMR as opposed to uh, kind of more of a dedicated what we think of maybe a sniper rifle. Um, you know it's definitely something that was more embedded into a unit and utilized that way kind of like how we talk about PSLs being embedded in a unit and not 
like a, a, you know, there's compromises made so that they can still take part in the unit. One of which is the fact that the DMR um, version of the QBZ-191 still maintains select fire capability. They wanted you to be able to support the rest of your unit and to take place in a firefight with as much as possible the same utility as someone who's using a standard carbine rifle, uh, which, in, you know, did result in the fact that you have to make those compromises as opposed to being a super dedicated, you know, accurate rifle for long distance shooting. It's a more accurate rifle. You're going to have a better you know, magnified optic. You're going to have the longer barrel for better ballistics, but it's still geared toward being able to use it as a fighting rifle when you need to. Um, again, we kind of go back to a more traditional design internally as well. It is no longer strike fired. It is hammer fired. Uh, we still maintain the adjustable gas block and, you know, it's just, it's a really kind of interesting, almost uh, reminds you of a variation of an AR-15, like the Taiwanese T-91, which, uh, you know, again, short, short gas operation. It has the rotating bolt. It's very much based on the AR-15 with the upper and lower lumen receivers. Uh, and the Taiwanese T-91 was also adopted in 2003 when the Chinese adopted their uh, QBZ-03. And the QBZ-191 is basically just an updated QBZ-03. So it kind of makes you wonder, like, you know, uh, did they see the T-91 being developed and, and possibly copy that? Uh, or is this truly like an original design and it's just an issue of kind of convergent design where obviously many companies have come to the conclusion that the, the short stroke gas operation with the rotating bolt is a kind of optimal way of designing a rifle and the Chinese just also reached that conclusion. Uh, yeah, you know, I think that, uh, again, we. We don't get as much information about Chinese rifles because of the fact that uh, China does not share information as well and the fact that we cannot import a lot of these firearms into the US. So I thought that taking a look at Chinese firearms would be a really interesting topic and something that, you know, it's not something you hear every day uh, when you're going through and looking at information on different firearms from different places. So yeah, I definitely hope you enjoyed, you know, watching the video and uh, and hopefully learning a little bit about, you know, Chinese firearm development, uh, you know, I think all firearm development is interesting, but again, specifically, it's just not a topic that we top, touch on here with, as far as uh, Chinese rifles. So as always, if you think the stuff we have on the wall in the in the video room is cool, you should definitely go check out cfcontest.com. There's cool stuff happening over there all the time. And uh, until then, guys, we definitely appreciate it and hope to see you back for the next video. God bless.